Um, okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome um, to the, the presentation of the launch of the report of the International um, Monetary Fund uh, on Africa. Uh, I am here, my name is Angelica Basquera. I'm here representing the Center of African Studies um, that is hosting the launch of the report. Uh, I am bringing also the apologies of our director, Professor Adam Abib, uh, who was supposed to um, launch, uh, to do, sorry, to do the welcome remark today. Um, and unfortunately, uh, due to some emergency, he was not able to, to attend. Um, but we are very uh, pleased to uh, be able to host here today uh, the Deputy Director of the Africa Department of the International Monetary Fund, uh, Catherine Patillo, on, um, on the right side and um, also from the same team um, uh, Wen Jie Cheng uh, um, the deputy D uh, division chief of the regional study division of the Africa department of the International Monetary Fund um, and also uh, from SOAS um, we have our global professor um, uh, professor Arkebe Kubai who is the British Academy global professor um, and based at SOAS department of development studies uh, Professor Okuba is going to be our uh, main um, discussor and moderator uh, from SOAS. Uh, now, to say a few words uh, about Catherine Patillo, the Deputy Director of the Africa Department. Uh, she oversees the work of a number of country teams, uh, capacity development, among uh, other roles. Prior to that, she served in the Fiscal Affairs Department, where she was Chief of Division responsible for the IMS Fiscal Monitor. Um, since joining the fund from a position at Oxford University, she has worked in the research department and on countries in Africa and the Caribbean, and the strategy policy and review department as well. She received a PhD in economics from Yale University. A welcome, Catherine. Um, and a few more words also about um, the, our uh, second uh, representative from the IMF, uh, Wen Jie Chen. Uh, she is the, the Deputy Division Chief of the Regional Studies Division in the Africa Department, as well as a Mission Chief to Mali in particular. Uh, she started her career as an Assistant Professor of International Business and International Affairs at George Washington University. And then she joins the fund uh, in 2014 in the African Department. And she worked on South Sudan, uh, Eswatini and South Africa. Um, so welcome as well. I mean, there is more to say. <laughs> She's, uh, you know, uh, but I will, I will stop here. Welcome, uh, welcome, Wenji. And we look forward. She will present uh, uh, the report uh, with the PowerPoint. So going in detail about the funding of the report. Uh, finally, a brief introduction uh, to our own uh, Professor Arkeb Okubai. Uh, British Academy Global Professor at SOAS, but I just want to say uh, Professor Okubai also conducted his PhD at SOAS, and so he is, he is part of the SOAS family uh, for a long time. And he has been a groundbreaking academics and researcher uh, on the African continent. Um, he, um, he was also, if I may say, a former mayor of Addis Ababa, and he contributed a lot to the industrial development of his own country, Ethiopia, but not only because he's a very influential in the industrial uh, development across the continent uh, through the African Union and other uh, glue, uh, other continental uh, uh, institutions on the continent. So we are very lucky that he has chosen SOAS uh, to be his home for his British Academy uh, professor, professorial role. And today also in particular, I would like to thank him personally and also from our director uh, for taking the lead in, in this very important event, which we hope it will be one of many engagement with the International Monetary Fund. Uh, I will uh, now finish my introduction. Thank you again to the on-campus audience. And we know it's a time of uh, exam and it's a time of uh, many sort of commitments. So thank you for those who made the time to come. And also, uh, we are very pleased to say that we have a very large online audience uh, today. And so we have people from across the continent joining us in the, this event. And when it comes to the Q&A, we will also ask questions from the online audience. Uh, I will now pass it on to uh, Catherine. Uh, to make her presentation uh, about the report. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, and welcome everyone. We're very happy to be here and to be able to interact uh, with SOAS. 
our first time here. And um, yeah, we hope this is the, the first of, of many. We love coming to universities because you get the most challenging comments and questions, which really help us to continue to think more deeply and think what are the different uh, perspectives and different kind of questions that we need to look into going going forward. So please challenge us uh, and uh, push uh, for how you see things. Um, that's that's really what we're we're hoping for. Um, so just a couple introductory points. Um, so we're presenting the Regional Economic Outlook for spring 2023. Um, this is an analysis that we do every six months, uh, and we then launch uh, both during the annual and spring meetings in Washington, but then in the region. So we're just from Nigeria, and colleagues are launching also in Abidjan and, and Paris. Um, and the objective of the publication is to look deeply at the current developments, at projections, and at what are the analytic um, underpinnings of, of some key uh, policy issues. Um, so um, again, prefacing what we're gonna we're talk, talk about, just a, a couple of points first, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa um, is currently facing a very difficult situation, but it's important to put in perspective also that this is now um, uh, a series of shocks, or we could really call them crises after crises after crises, uh, right? So the, the, the region faced the the really big impact of the, the COVID pandemic where we saw the largest recession in, in history since the 70s. Um, and then the uh, you know, impact of the Russia's war in Ukraine and the um, shooting up of fuel, fertilizer, food uh, prices, um, subsequent um, impacts now of the tightening of global monetary conditions and, and high borrowing costs. Um, and um, all of that con uh, in confluence leading to a really cost of living crisis with the very high prices. Um, and now what Wenji is going to talk about this big funding squeeze. So, and this is for a region that has some of the lowest buffers going into this series of external shocks and some of the highest poverty levels in the world. Um, any single one of these crises is a once in you know very, very many number of years crises, but to see them piled one on top of each other in this short proximity uh, is really, you know, an external pounding of, um, you know, kind of unfathomable dimensions. <laughs> um, so, so that's one one point of context. Second, um, we're going to talk about debt, and you know, there's a lot of interest in debt issues, big kind of sexy topic, um, but. Uh, to put out there uh, right away that um, we don't see uh, any widespread or systemic debt crisis in the region. Um, there are liquidity issues, and uh, Wenji will, will talk um, about that. Um, but we also see that countries are very much facing what are, yes, increasing debt vulnerabilities. Um, and very much head on um, addressing for those countries that you know need de debt restructuring moving in that direction, those select few and otherwise very much confronting um, the challenge that's there from some increasing vulnerabilities. Uh, third point um, from our side in the IMF, um, we are playing our part um, uh, really, 
uh, trying to be an important countercyclical financing source uh, in um, uh, a time of very procyclical private flows um, and uh, addressing then the um, deep shocks that that countries are are facing. Um, uh, and we're also um, then cognizant that there's going to be a lot more need for support from the IMF and our concessional financing facility uh, needs replenishment. Um, and so um, one message during our spring meetings was the need for um, support from the international community, uh, including rechanneling of special drawing rights um, for uh, allowing us to continue to support um, uh, countries with financing. But in addition to financing, um, the, the IMF um, has um, important interactions with African countries um, on our policy advice and on capacity development, that's technical assistance and, and training. And that technical assistance and training is kind of the, the unsung hero, I think, of what the, the IMF does um, around the region. But in, in Africa, Africa's actually, Sub-Saharan Africa is the largest recipient of capacity development. And um, the, ways that we're able to support countries um, and look for then the synergies between this capacity development, the lending and the and the policy advice is really a core part of, of how we, we work. Um, and it's very much together with the countries also. I think sometimes there's this image that the IMF comes in and says, this is this. Is this. <laughs> um, uh, but um, we work, you know, very closely with um, with the authorities in developing what are policy packages that can help, you know, support strong, inclusive, and increasingly now green uh, growth. We have the same objectives. Um, we're um, we aim to be a trusted advisor. That means there's a need for tough messages um, sometimes, um, but uh, our partners um, in the countries tell us that this role of, of trusted advisor, of trying to you know, help them with some of these tough issues where countries are right now um, is, is very much valued. Um, and we are, you know, an institution that is always changing and uh, growing and developing. And that's, again, why we like to come and, and uh, talk to people. Um, uh, um, you know, a, a number of the issues that we currently uh, look deeply into are things that the IMF would not have focused on, um, you know, some years ago. So the importance of understanding, you know, inequality because, and, and how policies affect inequality, and then how if you don't have um, more, um, you know, attention to uh, equality, then again, you're not going to get strong uh, growth and robust, sustainable uh, development. Um, uh, gender uh, and some another dimension of inequality that again is is there and needed for for strong sustainable growth, governance supporting countries then um, as they tackle uh, governance challenges and increasingly now climate the existential crisis of the of the of the world and therefore um, critical for for us as we interact um, with with countries. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm hoping that we're able, if there are any questions more, more generally about the, the fund role to, uh, engage in that as part of our, our discussion. So with that background, let me turn over to, to Wenji. Thank you. Thank you so much.
for the uh, warm welcome and uh, very delighted to be here. My past life before the IMF, I was a professor and I always really enjoyed um, talking to students and teaching. And so this is an excellent opportunity to revisit that. I think the slides are up. Can you see? And so uh, Kathy gave really the, the main highlights of the report, but let me delve a little bit deeper into the various components on what we mean by a funding squeeze and what the implications are for the countries in the region. And then lastly, let me um, elaborate a little bit on the policy recommendations that we have zeroed in on this chapter. And just to keep in mind, when we mean by Sub-Saharan Africa, we have a subset of 45 countries that we talk about that are really in the, in the Sub-Saharan uh, region of, of the country. So sometimes, you know, um, there are different compositions. So let me dive right in here in terms of what we mean by this recent funding squeeze. And there are three main manifestations. The really big one is the rise in borrowing costs. What we mean by that is you see on the upper right-hand side chart in terms of the sovereign spreads um, of the, uh, the, the rates, um, in fact, for Sub-Saharan Africa, excluding Zambia and uh, in the uh, lead up to most the most recent data I here highlighted in March 2023, there has been a steady rise, as you can see here. And this is the spread, what we call it, over the U.S. Treasury um, yields. And so virtually all of the frontier markets since spring 2022 have been shut out of the Eurobond market as a result, which you can see on the left-hand side graph. So there has been steady funding coming from the Eurobond markets, the bond issuances by these frontier markets. But since spring um, of last year, that avenue of financing has not been an option anymore. Um, so those two are the main manifestations in terms of higher borrowing costs, shutting out of the Eurobond market. And then the third one was the appreciation in the U.S. dollar to a 20-year high as of last year. And what that meant is that uh, for many of the countries in the region that have external debts that's denominated in U.S. US dollars in particular, which the majority of the, the external debt components are, um, that meant that the debt service for those countries, again, paying back the interest rate, paying back the principal payments in dollars, then would also rise in terms of their, their um, local currency values. So those are the three manifestations. Why do we observe that? Well, it's because of uh, the main factor is the global monetary policy tightening. That's a fancy term, really, for raising interest rates by major central banks in advanced economies. And why did they do that? That was in reaction to persistently high inflation, partly triggered by the Russian war in Ukraine, but also because of supply chain issues, remnants from the COVID pandemic. Um, and, and as a reaction to that, as the interest rates were rising, we could see the dollar going back uh, in, in value and then capital flows flowing out of emerging markets back into the U.S., and then also as a result, the sovereign spreads for many of the emerging markets, in particular for Sub-Saharan African countries, because already of lower credit ratings and the risk repricing in the market, those sovereign spreads then increased as a result of those. And this, these what we call conjunctural factors, so these you know, very, very recent phenomenon of these interest rate hikes of this, this borrowing cost rises comes on top of structural developments. And what do I mean by that? It's a few confluence um, of, of factors. The one is the decrease in overseas development assistance and aid, in other words, um, from advanced economies. And uh, those have been declining over the last 20 years. You see on the upper left-hand side chart, you had about 4% um, of recipient GDP um, in terms of ODA flows back in, in the 2000s. And then more recently, although there was an increase during the pandemic year, um, on, on average, in terms of trend-wise, it's only at around 2.5% of recipient GDP, which is quite significant in terms of the external funds flows that comes um, into the region. The other structural factors that we have seen is the decline in loan disbursement inflows, in fact, uh, from China. 
and it peaked in around uh, 2016. Um, and now it's only really a tenth of what was before in more recent years. And given the more geoeconomic fragmented worlds and the trends that we see, um, this trend might persist also in, in the near future. And lastly, um, we have seen also a change in the composition of the debt um, profile in many sub-Saharan African countries. And you see that on the right-hand side chart uh, when um, the HIPIC area happened, you see towards the beginning of the 2000s, domestic and Eurobond type of debt was less than 50% of total debt. And now it's almost three fourths of the, the portfolio. And why is that significant? It's significant because generally domestic debt and uh, the Eurobond type of debt are privately uh, subscribed debt. And, and that comes with higher servicing costs, higher interest bills that then eat up on the government funds and the revenues of those authorities. Now, going forward, um, to give you a little bit of preview in terms of the right-hand side chart, in fact, there are maturing Eurobonds, so payments that are coming due starting this year, which is smaller in terms of proportion, but really next year, about $6 billion um, US dollars, and then the following in 2025, about $7 billion. So that money alone, these governments have to set aside in terms of repayment of what's coming um, do or have a plan in order to roll over some of that um, that uh, coming due uh, payments, uh, but essentially that will be at the cost of financing towards other things and needs are still very high. And also on top of that, um, the current external environment, as I mentioned before, Jer economic fragmentation, there's also China's change in policies, but other needs are coming in terms of um, climate change risks, for instance, as Kathy mentioned before, this, the region is disproportionately impacted by the negative impacts of climate change. And um, in addition to the developmental needs that's already facing, these governments also have to make room to address these natural disasters and making um, plans for adaptation as well as mitigation um, changes. So those are some of the immediate and longer term concerns that I just mentioned. Um, let me go into more detail what I mean by those. In the immediate um, uh, term, what we see in terms of how this funding squeeze is going to impact um, these countries is one in terms of the food insecurity that's very prevalent in the region. And this was really at the height of so last year, um, given the war in Ukraine and the, the supply chain issues that came from that, the, the increase in food prices and grains, in particular in fertilizers that then impacted also local production on food. And we saw really uh, an increase in international food prices, but also the incidence of food insecurity increase um, significantly. For 2022, we estimate that 132 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa are either experiencing acute food insecurity or under high risk of food insecurity. And given the funding squeeze, there will be fewer resources uh, at the government's disposal in order to address those vulnerable um, people in terms of um, those that face food insecurity. The other impact that we see in terms of the funding squeeze is on growth um, directly. And so for this current year, 2023, we estimate uh, overall growth for the region to be at 3.6%. And it's noteworthy that this is the second year in terms of a decline in growth compared to the previous year. So for 2022, we had 20, uh, sorry, we had 3.9%. And so this is really compared to our projection in 2021, which was at 4.1%. And so in, in this particular case, um, it's, it's also contributed by South Africa in terms of its growth slowdown, which we project at 0.1% only for this year. But um, many smaller countries or other countries in the region have of course, various different growth, but overall as the region, we see this downward trend, which is quite worrisome. 
For 2024, we do see a rebound um, to 4.2% of GDP for the region, but that's really predicated on many factors, in particular on the global recovery. Um, in, in, in particular there, we expect that inflation will be more moderate, in particular in terms of energy prices, food prices, which then therefore um, would only require a smaller interest rate hikes or very moderate interest rate hikes, which then will not slow down the economy as much. Um, we describe this, this uh, growth rebound as a two-speed recovery. And that's because we see mostly that this growth is supported by non-resource intensive countries. So countries that don't rely on uh, commodities in terms of exports, mm -hmm. those are the ones that really um, going to take off. You can see on the right-hand side chart in the bottom there, whereas oil exporters, particular Nigeria, for instance, those don't tend to actually grow as much or contribute as much to the, to the growth um, increase and rebound. Now, shifting from these shorter-term implications to longer-term implications, um, we see that debt vulnerabilities is going to be on the rise. And you can see on the left-hand side charts, um, it's interesting for the median country, you see this in the um, uh, dotted or in, in the, the orange line when it bottomed out in 2010 at about 30% of GDP, now debt is twice as high uh, in the most recent accounting here around 60% of GDP. So again, debt has increased considerably. It's not quite as high as during the HIPIC era, but it's much closer to that than what we had um, in, the, in the early 2010s. So again, as uh, Kathy mentioned before, some of these issues of the funding squeeze, if they get don't don't get resolved, we could potentially see how those could turn into solvency issues when countries actually cannot uh, repay the debt. But so far, we do not see that yet. Those are longer term um, issues that that are potentially um, at risk. So let me go into then some of our policy implications, and there are many, and they're very country specific and in our daily work, when we work with countries directly on a bilateral basis, we have really country specific recommendations, but for the report, because we write about these 45 countries as a whole, we really highlight some of the top and key four policies. And let me start here with the fiscal policy. And there, the number one, priority for us is to reduce debt vulnerabilities. And you can see here, as I mentioned before, um, many countries have now higher public debts. And you see in the left-hand side chart, 19 of our 35 low-income countries in the region are experiencing high risk of debt distress or are already under debt distress. And then on the right-hand side chart, we did an analysis of which countries are actually in need of fiscal adjustment, really meaning to tighten their uh, their fiscal um, deficit that are, they're running versus those countries in the black bubbles, which has still have some fiscal space um, to maneuver. And you can unfortunately see here on the right, you have many more countries in the orange bubbles that are in need of fiscal adjustment. And one of the reasons here that we point out in the report also is that tax revenue, so the ability for countries to raise revenues in terms of taxes, is remains uh, somewhat low in Sub-Saharan African countries, actually significantly lower compared to other emerging markets, which you see on the left-hand side chart. So the median um, tax revenue to GDP is only a little bit above 10% for the, the Sub-Saharan African country, whereas it's closer to 20%. And then when you go to advanced economies, um, a little even closer to 30%. Um, and, and there, there's a lot of room to improve what we call domestic revenue mobilization. This can be done through increases in the tax base. So in terms of expanding the number of firms, expanding the number of people that could be taxed, um, but then also on the spending side, be very careful in terms of how 
these revenues, these precious free revenues that are left um, are being spent and really look at the efficiency of the spending to um, also limit the leakages, the wastages, um, and in terms of I know off budgetary commitments on SOEs um, and and any below the line what we call unaccounted for spending, um, those should be really minimized. Uh, let me then turn to the second priority in terms of the policies, and there we look into inflation monetary policy to address those. And in, in the chart on the right, you can see we looked into the details in terms of which countries in Sub-Saharan Africa are still experiencing a positive and upward trajectory in terms of their uh, inflation. We see about half of those countries in the region, whereas the other half, you can see in the orange line, have already experienced a clear peak in their inflation. It's already on a downward path. So therefore, our monetary policy here is quite nuanced for those countries where we see still very high inflation. We really caution them in terms of not letting off the, the foot off the gas pedal too, too, um, too quickly. And in this case, they really need to be vigilant and to, to raise interest rates so that it come, the, these inflation trends come down um, significantly in order to avoid any type of secondary round impacts that are called entrenched inflation that then translate into higher wages and then become really, really costly um, to address. Now, in terms of um, other countries that already experience a downward trend in inflation, um, those can therefore be more thoughtful about the trade-off between addressing inflation versus dealing with their still uh, recovery and, and uh, weak recovery in those countries. And in particular, what we see is that PAG countries generally have faced lower inflation because partly of the PAG, um, and also because um, some many of them actually had uh, in terms of their, their invoices in, in trade. Um, so how they how they treat with other countries would rather be in um in euros rather than US dollars. And so there they had lesser impact of the inflation coming through. Which brings me then to the third priority in terms of the policy recommendations, and that's on how to manage exchange rate pressures. As I mentioned before, the 20 year uh, high of the US dollar last year, it has come down since then, but we do expect that the value of the dollar will remain volatile and, and rather elevated um, in the foreseeable future. Many countries have tried to counter um, the depreciation in their own currency against the dollar. We've seen many various ways in terms of monetary policy but and, and reserves, but also administrative measures, which have been very distortionary. And what I mean by that is there have been ways of limiting currency on export and import restrictions in terms of the, the, the change and the, the um, availability of the FX. And in many of those cases, as a consequence, there had been a parallel market and that parallel market rate reacted out of bounds. And, and in the end, these countries did end up suffering higher inflation because of these measures anyway. So therefore it's very costly to implement those. And rather our advice here is because of these external circumstances, rather let the exchange rate adjust, but use your policy measures to really address the negative impacts to mitigate some of these negative impacts of higher prices, for instance, in terms of helping the most vulnerable that are bearing the, the most burden of those price increases, but also to use monetary policy and fiscal policy responsibly in order to address and contain these um, pressures. And uh, in, in relation to that, many countries do not have the reserves actually available. We see very low reserve coverage for the region in general, and they're the room for really defending their currency, not letting it just that room is running out um, as well. So lastly, in terms of priorities, we have structural reforms, which are front and center and necessary in order for the countries to get back on the growth trend that they have been before the pandemic. So for, for the region in general, we see actually that they are growing much on a lower trend. They're not growing in, in terms of the, the actual number is, is, is still high, but they have a lot of catch up to do in terms of getting back on trend in terms of their growth from before the pandemic. And their structural reforms are really needed 
um, in terms of building the resilience since they've been experiencing these shocks upon shocks that are mostly external, but yet because of these macro existing macroeconomic vulnerabilities, these countries were not able as, to cope with those external shocks as well as many of the advanced economies that had much bigger buffers um, that, were to, that were able then to counter those shocks. So their structural reforms will be necessary in order to build resilience. And that includes to broaden the fiscal revenue, the, the base to diversify funding sources if the external routes are, are more limited, it's now time to look domestically, to look into ways to unlock um, some of the fun funding sources. And that also includes um, catalyzing private financing, catalyzing entrepreneurs and building and facilitating um, the environment for, for domestic business um, growth. And within the structural reforms, we also include the need to address climate needs in terms of climate financing. And Sub-Saharan Africa's needs in that area are huge. So we estimate about $20 billion are coming in in terms of climate funding each year but the needs for adaptation alone are over $50 billion per year, and then even more for um, mitigation um, of, of, of climate change. And here uh, we have actually one of the analytical notes, the three of those, and one of them um, squarely looks into ways of how countries can actually increase the likelihood of receiving international concessional funding, but also maneuver within existing funds, climate funds, many of which have been remaining um, untapped. So there's a lot of funds that still needs remain to be unlocked. But for that, the countries need to have the right projects, need to have the right capacity, and need to identify really the, the acute ways of how these countries can use that fund, th those, those funding. And so the IMF, again, stands ready um, in that regard as well to help. We have a new facility, uh, the Resilience and Sustainability uh, Facility, where we can help these countries in terms of longer term to help them um, to attract those funds, to unlock some of the, the funding potential and to diagnose with them as well where the needs are for each particular country um, to, to address, um, uh, to, to use those funds. And let me end here with the international call for assistance, um, which in this case is so much needed given these very, very um, difficult times. And I, as I showed you in, in one of the first slides before, overall development assistance really has been declining. And that is a detriment to the region in terms of the counter cyclical financing that there's so much in need of um, right now. And the IMF, of course, has been helping. We have deployed about $50 billion in funds between 2020 and 2022. You can see the existing programs on the right-hand side chart. There's one more. We have 22 ongoing lending programs right now in the region of 45. And so that's very substantial. And so we continue also to provide technical assistance, capacity development, and stay engaged um, and um, help the countries where we can. Let me stop here and uh, look forward to your questions and also discussions with Mara. Thank you. Thank you, Kati. <clears throat> and uh, Wenji for the excellent uh, uh, presentation. Allow me to uh, thank uh, SOAS and Center for African Studies for organizing this uh, uh, workshop. And uh, let me thank IMF colleagues uh, for your time and for your excellent presentation. And I should also thank the audience for participating uh, on this important uh, conversation. My, uh, what I would like to uh, reflect uh, will be primarily uh, <clears throat> based on the presentation 
to give also an additional perspective in view of the long-term perspective of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. By the way, Katia, I don't like the word Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we have a continent, which is Africa, with 55 member countries. And uh, when it comes to UN, World Bank, IMF, then we have a division, Sub-Saharan Africa, then North Africa is with Middle East. It, it doesn't make sense, but it's not a problem of IMF. Uh, but we prefer to talk, uh, and myself, as an African policymaker, I prefer to say uh, Africa's continent. But I don't think there will be much fundamental change between the broader <clears throat> continent, including the North African region, and also uh, in particular Sub-Saharan Africa. We have huge economy, South Africa, which is even more industrialized than Northern region. So my uh, focus will be on three critical issues. First, this topic is so important because we are in the middle of multiple crises, as Katia and Wenji mentioned. We had COVID-19 pandemic and then recession, then the geopolitical crisis, and then the commodity prices crash before seven years in 2014, which affected the majority of uh, uh, commodity exports and the interventions done uh, during this crisis was too little and too late. Africa received less than 10% vaccination coverage while the wealthy nations had almost 100% coverage. Africa is lagged behind when more than $18 trillion was used to simulate the economy for economic recovery. So by the end of this crisis, uh, the continent has been left behind and is in a much worse situation than before the crisis. So this should be the, the, the bigger picture uh, because the issue is not about the fiscal stability or monetary stability or uh, correcting the macroeconomic balance this year or next year. It's about the basic fundamental vulnerability of the African economy. What COVID-19 had shown us and also the other crisis showed us were the vulnerability of the continent. With the Ukraine war, food inflation became a major issue and Africa was most affected. Why? We haven't been able to transform agriculture. We have not been able to make investment in food security. When it comes to energy inflation or cost of living was affected a big part by energy, it's also linked with the green transition, with the climate change uh, transition process as well. So my first point uh, is we need to link with this critical structural issue. And uh, also the, as the report indicates, the heterogeneity element is quite critical. Each country, the economic structure is different. Its vulnerability to a global crisis is quite different. And even the political uh, uh, commitment and the political economy factors are quite different. So the recommendations, the policy recommendations are not going to work equally uh, and are not going to have a similar impact among uh, African uh, member countries. And I should try also to highlight that this is linked with the broader debate in the US or advanced economies, emerging economies, we have seen many countries too, unlike 2018, rather than following austerity measures, they were able to put major investment, stimulate the economy, which they are, many of them are also using for green transformation and also uh, for uh, effective recovery process. So one of the bigger debates 
is that central governments, starting from Fed, are all raising interest rates with the assumption that the source of the current financial uh, difficulty or inflation is linked with circulation of money and a tighter monetary policy is required. So what we have seen is Fed, Central uh, European Bank, as well as over 80 central banks, all added interest rate, which is also slowing down the economy because with increase of interest rate, investment is going to be slowed. Cost of living is going to be affected. The foreign exchange supply is going to be uh, to decrease. So it's the response to inflation is one of the major drivers of this ongoing crisis. And I understand that this is an ongoing debate in the US or Europe, whether uh, increasing interest rate is going to fix the issue. So we need to put this as uh, within this uh, perspective. The second point I would like to highlight is, how do we ensure this continent moves to a new trajectory is going to be a central issue. Uh, one of the key observations that we saw during COVID crisis was the financial and monetary space of many African countries was limited, which is linked with the uh, economic growth of, uh, uh, of many African countries. So from this perspective, if we look uh, the trajectory side, and in view of the global context, we have seen prices, the frequency of uh, prices and volatility of global economy is not diminishing, it's increasing. Since 2000, we have seen almost two major global crises. 2020, the worst one. So the global economy is now with uh, the volatility, the uncertainty, and the simultaneous and overlapping crisis is an inherent situation that we need to cope, be it the world's country, be it Africa. So within this holy crisis, within this uh, slowing down of the global economy between 2000 and 2020, or 2022, the global economic growth has slowed from 4% to about 1.9%. So this is an ongoing trend, and we have to bear this in mind when we design the policies in Africa. From this perspective, I want to highlight is African policymakers, African governments have now to refocus on the path of economic transformation if we have to tackle this challenge, not next year, but in the coming years, because that is the only way we can, we can manage. What is in our hands is not global assistance, but what is in our hands is the policy instruments that governments can use. So I would strongly recommend, and African countries should be, governments should be advised that it's economic diversification and growth is going to be the focus. One interesting uh, observation in the report, which I find very interesting from economic transformation point of view was, in relative terms, higher growth rate is going to be recorded by those which are not exporters of natural resources and the least excluding South Africa, which is quite a different type of economic structure, is mainly the oil producers who are going to record a slower economic growth. And with the green transformation coming and energy costs now diminishing and being equal to the price of fossil oil, oil producing countries, the most urgent agenda has to be how do they diversify from oil export and oil production 
to a more diversified economy. This is going to be necessary also with countries which are primarily commodity exporters. So I would like to emphasize it's so urgent, so critical that if we have to reduce the vulnerability of economies of many African countries, we need to diversify the economy and we need to record higher growth. Actually, the root of the cause of this uh, crisis, which we faced the last two, three years, can be traced back to the uh, decade following uh, the new millennium. In the 90s, the continent was only growing about 2.4%. Between 2000 and 2009 or 2010, African economies were growing by about 5.5%. And then it has slowed down after 2010 to about half of this uh, threat. What I would like to argue is the root causes or the sources of this slow economic growth starts from the early decade of 5.5%. Because if we refer to the GDP per capita, considering the population growth, actually many African countries were growing at about net one to two percent. And this is much slower than what we observe in Asia. And this is not going to help us catch up uh, with the uh, much more rapid economic growth. So this is one, one key element I would like to emphasize. The second point is the Ukraine war should be, a, should be an impulse, should be a trigger for African governments to take seriously the transformation of agriculture and food security. How can the continent be an importer of corn and wheat from Ukraine, from Russia? And the very reason that food inflation was much higher and it made the continent vulnerable was that African governments have neglected agriculture, have not invested in this sector. And we need this sector for food security. We need this sector for boosting the export, uh, generating export revenues. And one of the key, one of the key recommendations that should come from the simultaneous crisis we are facing is the need for refocusing on transformation of agriculture. And the third aspect is the shift from the commodity exports towards a much more diversified exports and also increasing the amount of export earnings that can be generated. Again here, African governments have to work on the policy side. As Wenji earlier highlighted, the US dollar is still going to be stronger and central banks is highly probable will be increasing interest rate. And this is going to diminish the reserve of foreign exchange of many African countries in the coming years. And here, the critical focus has to be, how do we address the shortage of foreign exchange? How do we create a policy environment, policy instruments to boost export sector should be one, one, one additional dimension. The fourth element, uh, we have been chatting with Cathy, the carbon neutral and green transformation is a critical way of addressing the vulnerability of this continent. Climate change is affecting Africa in the worst level. It's the most vulnerable while it only contributes about 4% to greenhouse emission. And the earlier we move, toward this direction, the carbon neutral path, the better we'll be able to catch up uh, and to cope up with the, uh, with the challenges of climate change. And one of the biggest uh, benefits of the Ukraine crisis has been, it has accelerated the shift 
from the fossil oil based economy towards uh, a green energy uh, driven economy. The move in the last two, three years is quite, quite dramatic. Beyond what we see, some countries importing uh, corn, the biggest wave we are observing is a green transformation and the move towards uh, carbon neutrality. So this need to be uh, brought in in this uh, process. And as we are talking on the aftermath of COVID crisis, because WHO announced last week that it's no more an international uh, uh, crisis, but we need to prepare for the coming pandemic as well. And the pandemic has uh, hurt the continent quite significantly. And it's time that we focus on building the primary uh, healthcare systems and also the early warning systems while we uh, focus on, on the economic transformation agendas. And from this uh, perspective, what we need to focus is to ensure that the government could play a strategic role that we also will be able to use industrial policy as an important uh, instrument and strategy to address this uh, challenges. And one, one important policy space we have observed is almost all countries starting from the US, European Union, all are now uh, boldly saying they are following and pursuing industrial policy. And this is a positive element because it has been a major uh, constraint. So on the policy recommendations, we need to primarily focus on these issues. Uh, while also implementing the recommendations by the IMF, which will primarily focus on the macroeconomic aspect. Lastly, well, how can the global uh, community or how can a supportive global architecture be created is the last point uh, that is critical to raise. This is not, Africa has its own homework and governments have not been able to implement and design and implement the required policies. But also the global dimension, the global crisis is beyond the reach of many low-income developing countries. And we need to address the existing international governance systems that are not favorable for many low-income uh, developing countries. Here I would like to put reforming the WTO architecture in a way that favors developing countries in terms of trade, investment, and technology uh, transfer. The continent also needs to engage more with South-South and also emerging economies. And if I'm, uh, the report I saw in 2022, I think Asia was the contributor 70% to growth of world economy and 50% came from China and India. So we need to diversify. We need to uh, strengthen the engagement also with the uh, emerging economies. And also we need to advocate uh, for this global compact for just transition, which was also mentioned by Katie and uh, Wenji. On the depth stress and the depth uh, vulnerability, some of the interventions that have been done by IMF, G20 in the last two, three years were not adequate. 50 billion is not going to bring much difference in the coming years. It raises a major issue. How do we create a sustainable debt mechanism that is conducive to uh, low-income developing countries? In this formula, it also needs to be brought the issue of debt cancellation and debt restructuring. And this requires, as it was earlier mentioned by uh, Wenji on the last uh, conclusion, the international community should be able to come up together how to ensure that developing countries are not left behind. And this is important, not 
because of generosity, but because there needs to be uh, uh, a mutual benefit. So these are the points I would like to highlight. And uh, I will first invite Katie and Wenji if they would want to uh, share their remarks, and then we'll have Q and A uh, from audience and online. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Um, I mean, there's so much of what you said that we totally, totally agree with. Most of what uh, you you put forward um, uh, on the issue of diversification, um, the the important question is how. <laughs> and what are those policies? Um, and one point to note is that we think there's a lot of potential in regional trade integration and the Africa for continental free trade area offers a real potential um, that um, could then spur um, more um, cross-border production linkages that would help with uh, diversification. So the agenda is there for countries that they've committed to this uh, free trade uh, area, to reducing tariff barriers, non-tariff barriers to behind the border. And that could bring, I think, quite a bit of the diversification as well as, as you were highlighting the need in this fragmented world uh, to connect to new partners, um, but also um, recognize the need for resilience um, in, internally. Um, but maybe maybe we stop there and see, we can pick up on some of the other themes um, with, uh, with questions. Yes, huh? yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. Very interesting. Um, we're sorry we're running a little bit out of time, but it's fine. Uh, so uh, we have uh, like three, four questions from the online and also from the audience, I think there are. So what I'll do, I'll pick three questions from the audience and then three online. Would that be okay? Try to keep them brief, please. So we have a, a microphone, yeah. So who is, ah, there is this lady. Okay, ladies first. <laughs> Up there, um, yeah. If you want to also quickly introduce yourself, if you're a small student, or thank you. I'm I'm a lay person. I don't actually attend SOAS. I'm just on the Royal Africa Society Excellent. website. Um, there are a lot of things I want to say, but for the sake of time, I will try and um, uh, reduce or make it more concise. I do part of the reason why I came is I was quite, uh, for lack of a better word, tickled by the concept of this. I was interested. I was intrigued to hear the perspective of the um, IMF representatives but to me if you allow me a facetious analogy it's akin to um going to a loan shark being beaten and robbed and hospitalized by the loan shark and then the loan shark being told to come and comment on your progress while you're in hospital so um I, there were lots of things that were raised in the presentation that i um wanted to um basically address but also ask so uh tax revenues were mentioned um and I thought, actually, I think it's quite telling what wasn't said. So tax revenues are mentioned and the and the and the lack of um, and proportionally how there isn't much raised from tax revenue without mentioning how much of, is down to capital flight, um, corporations not paying their due in these countries um, and billions lost that could be invested in the public sector. And also uh, during Wenji's um, I'm a lay person, I'm not an economist, so this is, you know, I, I apologize I apologize if I don't have the technical savoir faire, savoir faire. but from what I do understand, um, Wendy, you, you spoke about some kind of a fiscal prudence when it came to um, weathering these shocks, uh, which I found quite euphemistic. I know you didn't use the word prudence, but I'm just using that as a, as a summary of what you said. Um, and I think... Uh, I didn't know I would have liked you to expand on what you in regards to this tightening that you that you you recommended and just looking at the history of the IMF in terms of structural adjustments um, and the uh, encouragement not to invest in pub, the public sector or to basically austerity as being pushed by the IMF historically on these countries. Um, I find that quite worrying when I hear about tightening. And um, to speak to the chair's point about the agriculture, um, I, this is in no way to undermine the agency of African states and the leaders. They do have their responsibility. 
But again, um, <laughs> the investment in agriculture was severely undermined by structural adjust adjustment as uh, conditions for receiving loans. So the subsidies that government African states would give to their own farmers were meant to be um, removed at the advantage of overseas in so overseas in investment. And lastly, in regards to the climate change um, um, funding and um, resilience, I think um, I would use the word reparations here in terms of the, the lack of development funding. Development is a very colonial, neo-colonial model. I think um, it's really payback. <laughs> For basically a lot of industrialized nations making um, their money um, and their contribution to the climate crisis from the times of colonization. <clears throat> so I think we need to look, even if you don't want to use the word reparations, we need to look at some kind of maybe compensation. I'm trying to remember the name of the word that's used for, um, uh, it's gone out uh, of my head. Sorry to interrupt you, yes, but, but yes, thank you. Thank you so much. much. Sorry, thank sorry you. To Thanks a lot. Mind. Okay, so yeah, um, we had one at the front. And then there's uh, the lady at the back. And then, yeah, you came full, sorry, <laughs> after. Are you an economist? <laughs> All right. Well, I am, and I've been the top rated private sector frontier economist for a few years um, with Renaissance Capital. <laughs> uh, when I was looking at Reinhardt and Rogoff's book about debt distress and ran the numbers of the 20th century, 90% of the countries that defaulted were high fertility countries. High fertility countries like high fertility families don't have cash, don't have savings. And then they borrow from abroad and, and go bankrupt. And that's what we've forgotten in the last 10 years because of Chinese money. Your presentation was excellent, by the way. Fantastic. So there's Chinese money and the debt forgiveness and then cheap global borrowing meant we didn't have to worry about who could borrow or not. Everyone could borrow cheaply. That's, that's unless the Fed slashes rates to very low levels very quickly, I think we are in a systemic crisis. You're suggesting we weren't. And I think the systemic crisis is because of this high fertility countries have taken on too much debt. We're not seeing this problem in most of Asia, low fertility Asia. Um, so it is a, a systemic problem. The private sector isn't going to catalyze. No funding is going to come to the private sector because of these defaults that are going to grow in size. So then it comes to what can be done in terms of special drawing right increase. So we've, we've only seen, what, 37 billion out of the 650 billion last year, I think, being reallocated to the RSF. 37? Is that right? And, and it could have been 100, 150, was what Gordieva was talking about, Macron, were talking about a year and a half ago. I was just wondering why we're not seeing 100, 150 billion, because I agree with your point, sir. There just isn't enough. 50 billion is it's brilliant. The IMF has found 50 billion, but it's not enough, given the systemic problems. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, maybe you can pass the lady behind you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so the uh, I thought you had a question. Hi. Um, my name is Mtutuzi. I I'm a student here at SOAS, but I also run a business in South Africa. Um, that's the reason I'm interested in this topic. Um, so. The IMF provided some debt funding to South Africa in, this was for the COVID-19 debt funding. I'm interested to find out the conditions of that loan and with respect to the growth requirements that you've put forward as a suggestion, suggestion going forward. And the reason being is that South Africa's growth is mean on a macro basis, it's, it's, it's being said that it's low because of its, you know, fiscal, uh, whatever reforms and energy and other factors. But what's silent, what's never been spoken about, is the issues around inequality in the country and their contribution to slow growth. And the sister lady spoke about the issues around the, the tax base. The tax base in South Africa is so skewed towards the rich, and we're not seeing that expanding. And I'm not too sure if the IMF is considering those conditions as part of providing the debt to, to African countries as what are those countries doing around inequality issues in, for them to be providing the so-called fiscal gap. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so these are the three questions we picked from the audience. So if you would like to respond briefly and then I'll pick, uh, given the time, I probably pick two from the online. Okay. Thank you. So 
actually there were more comments than than questions. Yes, uh, largely. Um, so um, a couple of of reactions, and then I'll ask Wenji also um, and Professor. Yeah, um, I think uh, your reactions too would be would be good. Um, but um, on um, you know tax revenues uh, and the fact that you know corporations are not paying. Um, yes, the push for domestic revenue mobilization has to be about progressive taxation. Um, and again, in each country, that's going to be uh, different. Um, and taxation is a very deeply domestic political uh, topic. And so each country is looking to see um, within its political space and its social contract how it can develop um, the best um, plan for um, for building taxes, which then help um, the citizens be able to hold government accountable to by saying we have a stake in this. Um, uh, we're providing our money, and you um, uh, then provide good government and, and good services. Um, and so our discussion with countries on these on these deeply political issues is about how to, to build a tax structure that is uh, progressive and where um, you know those who pay their fair shares. Um, um, yeah, your la the last point about um, thinking about climate um, that the advanced economies very much have a duty. Um, I think this is the global discussion now. The loss and damage fund that was um, uh, instituted in, in the last COP, um, and a, a recognition that um, the developing countries in Africa are going to need um, uh, climate finance. The bulk of the issue was created by advanced economies, and low income countries in Africa are some of the most vulnerable. Um, and they don't have the space um, themselves. Um, they have an important role uh, to play, um, but there will need to be this, this partnership. Um, one of our messages is that the push also for climate finance needs to be additional than to um, other aid for basic needs for education, health, and, and infrastructure. So it should be on top um, and not replace um, existing uh, support. Um, uh, on the relationship between you know, high fertility countries and, and debt defaults and what that this will mean, um, uh, I'm sure uh, your analysis you know, covers a, a lot of, of history, uh, but there I would guess that there are, you know, Lots and lots of factors um, associated then with the variation in um, debt defaults, and we have in general, you know, a lot of high fertility countries in the region, and the the their uh, experience with respect to um, both what um, you know internally policies, fiscal, um, you know, other policies uh, have, have driven increased debt and the external is quite varied. So um, I'm, I, I would guess there's not, you know, kind of a monocausal uh, relationship here. Um, uh, but, but, I, but the point that um, in this, difficult world, we're going to need to really see um, whether it's going to be possible to address debt vulnerabilities and still then have new private inflows um, um, catalyzed uh, is an important question. We were able to do that post-HIPIC, right? So um, uh, it's, not, it's not clear to me that, again, in the discussion right now, which is looking at individual countries who are at that point and then saying, you know, there's a cutoff here. 
um, and let's address this debt difficulty and then and then move on. Um, but that's not possible. That's also been the history of of uh, a lot of um, debt restructurings that countries have gotten out and then been able to um, come, uh, you know, come back. Um, uh, yeah, on 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 South Africa. Um, I mean, in general, um, the emergency financing during the pandemic um, was provided to countries exactly in because of the emergency nature, <laughs> and so these were not programs with conditionality. The emphasis then was helping countries that needed to be able to support uh, their populations. Um, because of the dire um, impacts of, of COVID, uh, but with an emphasis then on um, spend the money well and keep the receipts. <laughs> um, and so an important push uh, in terms of governance then of um, encouraging countries to um, continue to do audits, to look at, um, how that that money was being spent um, to ensure um, everyone that that it uh, it was being uh, well spent, um, and your other point on on inequality, I think, is very well well um, taken. Um, the longstanding issues on on inequality in in South Africa are um, issues that yeah are. Uh, team is has, is very much engaged, and I think people recognize the structural issues in in South Africa, um, and the need for you know more private investment, addressing governance, creating jobs that'll help reduce inequality um, is really important for for the South African uh, growth agenda. Yep. Can I just just no, in terms of um, to, to the first speaker, thank you very much um, for the comments. And I think one of the things um, to, to note, and I always encourage students in particular to check out some of our work at the IMF, the recent work. And my belief is that the IMF has really changed significantly in the last several decades. And I think there's still these myths, not myths, but the earlier work that, that, you know, has been done in the 1980s and the 1990s, but really today's IMF in terms of, you know, on the ground work that we do, we have three main pillars. We have lending, which is actually a smaller portion. It's significant for Sub-Saharan Africa, but among our 190 member countries, what we actually mostly do is surveillance, what we call. So we have the Article 4 staff report that we issue and within that, each country team engages really actively with the member country. And we go into the country, we'll learn about the economy from 10,000 feet, but yet in terms of the macro linkages of these countries, in terms of all the various sectors that are critical to the overall macroeconomic well-being of the countries. And you know, our dialogue with these countries has shifted quite a bit over the years. And uh, we care, as, as Kathy was highlighting, in terms of the areas that we cover, we have really expanded beyond just the pure economics. We have now also gone into climate, for instance, into structural reforms. That was somewhat of a new thing, even for us as coming in. Um, you know, when I was a young economist um, doing my internship in the early 2000s, and uh, that was really a new avenue at the time. And now it's part of the core um, work that we do as well. And in, in the programs, when we go, keep in mind something has gone awfully wrong for us to step in, in terms of a program that we, we do with the country, in terms of the lending that we provide. We are the lender of last resort. And, and somewhere along the line, this country has run into problems in terms of financing its expenditure. So somewhere there, the the, the spending has has been above its means what it's being able to raise so we, we do go in um to help the country in terms of finding a way out of this but nowadays we do have a floor in fact on social spending that we need to protect the most vulnerable and that we need to strengthen the social safety net 
and the well-being of those people that are most affected. So those are all elements that we take into account. And it's, you know, country by country in particular. And this report, again, I stressed there before I started, it's for 45 countries. So I, we cannot go into all the nitty gritty details for each individual country. Otherwise, I would still be sitting here and writing. <laughs> but uh, really, I encourage you to, to look at the individual reports that, that we, we put out on the various different countries in South Africa in particular. You know, I cover Mali, for instance, that the report will be coming up beginning of June. And there we go into a host of different issues that um, I think, you know, back in the day, so to speak, um, we're, we're not necessarily there even at, at that point, but also that that we care more about now in our daily work today. Let me stop here. Uh, thank you. Uh, perhaps because time is very ticking, unfortunately, especially for the online audience. Thank you so much for everybody for coming. Uh, there were some comments online, which I'm trying to summarize very briefly. They're all asking about, yes, the, uh, the issue of the interest rates mm -hmm. and why in Africa interest rates are higher. Uh, are so much high and people are concerned about that and again some question around the fact of sort of like this kind of uh, blanket over all african economies uh, at this but you already answered that you already answered that by saying that you are uh, you know today it's the overall report but people should really more looking at individual reports per country and because yes this uh, sort of uh, stereotype of the imf being uh, you know looking at africa as a whole has changed uh, over time and uh, so we should, uh, yeah, perhaps look more in details. Uh, but I think those were the question from the from the audience, pretty much mm -hmm. looking at. So I think they match the uh, the on campus. So thank you very much, everybody. Mm -hmm. A big uh, round of applause to our speakers. Uh, so thank you so much, Ifarkebe. You want to say a few words of closure? Thank you, Angelica. I just want to thank uh, uh, Kati and Wenji uh, for their uh, uh, elaborations and uh, giving satisfactory answers. Uh, to the audience, I want to highlight the report from the IMF will provide one perspective. It's an institution and it has mandates, uh, its focus. Uh, is also uh, quite uh, different. And all reports, the World Bank report or UNCTAD report uh, and uh, Economic Commission for Africa report or ADB, they all provide a different shade uh, of uh, assessing the, the economic uh, outlook of the continent. Uh, so it's good to bear this in mind uh, on the issue of structural reform, when you has tried to highlight some of the uh, reforms uh, and changes. And I should acknowledge, for instance, at the uh, on the response to COVID, I think IMF uh, managing director uh, was quite bold to come up with some good initiative uh, before World Bank started to move. So it was a bit a reverse. Uh, <laughs> uh, not a competition, but um, I'm, I'm just, uh, it was so important the issues were raised. But the problem is the intervention that can be made is too little and too late. If vaccines could not be provided to the developing countries 100% with all the wealth, with all the resource, and the wealthy countries allocating 18 trillion for stimulus and recovery, then there is a big, a big uh, problem in the international governance system. Uh, so IMF has tried to move and has been raising the issues, but the problem is much more fundamental and we need to look at uh, this in mind. The economic system that's now vulnerable has now a key aspect, a key characteristic of increased financialization. This is a big uh, element that uh, with the banking crisis also now we see uh, that will have a significant negative impact across developing countries. So we see the vulnerability of the global economy. We need to bear that in mind. And for Africans, uh, despite 
the intervention and support coming from the international community or international system, I think we need to focus on what the, our governments should be should do. We need to put more pressure on that. We need to work on the policy side. We can't, without making investment in agriculture, we can't blame uh, I'm for any other uh, uh, external body to help us. So my emphasis is let's make our state apparatus, state capacities, garments to make a difference because all economies were able to catch up and to transform because they put maximum effort on the policy side that would transform their economies for a longer period. That's how China transformed itself in 40, 45 years. That's how uh, South Korea was able to become top 10. No, no, I, I, I fully understand. In supporting the uh, agricultural transformation, in the structural trans in the structural adjustment period, there was a pressure from IMF on ending subsidy, on diminishing the state role, on pushing privatization. We know that. But I just want to give you a quote what uh, uh, Abbasanjo, former Nigerian president, said some 15 years back in an interview on Newsicor uh, Time magazine. He said, in the 70s, Nigeria, we had started to transform our agriculture. But when we got abundant oil and we moved oil, we dumped agriculture. And agriculture is an area that is so important for job creation. One aspect that we haven't been able to raise now is the demography issue. Uh, our uh, friend has raised about high fertility. The theory I don't think works because in Africa, I can tell you in one of the countries, in urban fertility is 1.6%. And in some cases, it's uh, the fertility is about five to six per percent. So it's, there is a lot of uh, variation. We can't conclude. So on the demography issue, a critical element we need to say is about uh, the creation of jobs. Creation of jobs is an imperative for economic transformation and also political stability. Every year we are adding more than 20 million uh, in the working force that requires uh, urban-based uh, jobs. By after 25 years or 27 years, Africa will double in population, 2.5 billion. Yeah. We are not creating jobs. This is the biggest issue. If we have to create jobs, we have to focus on economic growth. We have to focus on production. We have to put in place economic policies relevant to boost this growth and transformation. That is where we are failing. And that is where some significant achievers like South Korea or China were able to invest their decades putting working hard uh, on that aspect. So I want to emphasize for colleagues coming from my continent, that is where we need to work. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Excellent. Fantastic uh, closing remark, I think. Yes. Really gave a, a nice overall uh, uh, picture. Thank you so much, um, everybody. I mean, you can still uh, hang around a little bit if you want to speak to our speaker, but I think some of them they have to leave. So unfortunately, we have to close this event, although there was like so much more that we could have actually uh, talked about. Uh, but hopefully it's a start for further conversation. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And I hope you really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much.